see everybody. Glad to see y'all here this evening. If you've all stand and turn to hymn number 609, 609, singing all five verses of No, Not One. If you all will stand.
uh, be with our local governments, and then Lord be with those in the White House and in the State House, and then Heavenly the Father in the Congress and the Senate, Supreme Court. Uh, Lord, uh, work as only you can uh, in people's hearts and lives. Lord, we know that prayer changes things. And Lord, for this war that's going on all over there in the Ukraine, uh, we would not fail, Lord, to uh, pray for those people, Lord, that you would, uh, Lord, uh, be with them. And, uh, Lord, give them, uh, Lord, be with them as you were with Samson, be with them as you were with Gideon, and uh, Lord, may they be uh, conquerors over the evil one and their enemies. Uh, Lord, and may they be able to fight them off and defeat, uh, Lord, uh, the foe. Lord, uh, be with us, Lord, now as we are going to watch this CD, Lord, and uh, see Brother Jeff the Lord and watch him as he preaches the word. Uh, thank you, Lord, that we have this kind of technology today that uh, we can use this to fill in. I pray you be with Brother John Bowling and Clearwater, bless him. The uh, Lord strengthen his voice, bring him out healing. Uh, Lord, that's all that you can in his behalf. Um, thank you, Father, for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.
of the judgment of God. I have two great loves in my life, personally, as a pastor. I have studied revival because it intrigues me. When I got saved and I started reading about who we were as a Baptist folk, it absolutely intrigued me that uh, our history was so absolutely replete, it was saturated in a movement of the Spirit of God. We were known, beloved, more for our brush arbors than we were our buildings. I love to sit at the feet of Dr. Jones, the great soul winner of South Carolina, who uh, had the honor of, in this very church, bringing ladies like Bertha Smith and being a friend of Percy Ray and talking about those days when the winds of God would blow through and ball games would be canceled and stores would shut down and the traffic would come to a crawl because the man of God was in the house. But I must admit to you tonight, beloved, that I am weary of reading about it historically. I am ready to experience it personally. Such a contrast of who we are today and who we used to be. And let me illustrate it this way if I can. I heard uh, about uh, a couple that had been married about 50 years up in the foothills of Tennessee where I, I was uh, born and raised. And Her name was Mildred and his name was Harold. And they lived up there in Phil Hoskins' country in the mountains, you know. And Harold was bad to go off hunting two, three days at a time. And old Mildred said to Harold one day, said, Harold, now son, you're getting old. We've been together now half a century. You peeling off in these woods and up these mountains three and four days at a time, a man your age, said, well, you're going to get lost up there. You're going to get hurt up there. We're never going to find you. Old Harold told Mildred, mind her business. Got the dogs, loaded them up in the truck. Went off into the mountains to go hunting. Day two passed. Day three went by. Day four. By day five, old Mildred had gotten concerned. And she went down to the local sheriff's department, walked in, and she immediately recognized a tremendous opportunity. Mildred saw a very young, astute, dutiful deputy, kind of a Barney Fife kind of fellow. <laughs> Sitting right there behind that desk, and, and he was just ready. His pencil was sharpened, his badge was shined, and he was waiting for any crisis at the moment. Mildred said to the young deputy, Son, I need to file a missing persons report. Young man said, Man, don't worry, don't worry, said I just graduated from the academy. He took out his official sheriff's pen, pulled out the official sheriff's missing person form, and he said, Now, ma'am, all we're going to need is a description of your husband. What's his name? She said, well, his name's Harold. She said, uh, he said, could you describe Harold? She said, oh, yes, oh, yes. Said, He's about six foot three. He has beautiful curly brown hair. Steel blue eyes. He is ripped in his abs. About that time, the sheriff was sitting just beyond Mildred's view. He rolled out from behind and said, Mildred, uh, I know Harold. Harold is not six foot three. He's a five foot two. He does not weigh 168 pounds. He weighs 268 pounds. He is not blue eyed. He does not have beautiful curly hair. He's bald. Mildred said, Well, Sheriff, I know that, but who wants him back? <laughs> Children of Israel did put away the Balaam and the Ashtoreth and served 
the Lord only. Now, Father, I pray that you may give me boldness to speak as an ambassador, to speak, O oh God, in the chains of the gospel, as I ought, if there be any spirit in this room that's not of the Holy Spirit, would you bind it, remove it, that we may give our fixed attention to the infallible word and the glorious work of the Holy Ghost of God. In Jesus' name, and you may be seated. Now, when we talk about revival, beloved, we know historically, we understand uh, the great moves of God like the first great awakening from 1725 to 1750, the personalities of Whitfield and Wesley. We understand the Moravians and, and the integral historical aspects of that. We understand Joseph Lambeer in 1956, an uh, 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 entrepreneur in a hardware store who got over a burden for his city that was seething off into a modern day Sodom and Gomorrah and began to pray. And out of that great uh, layman's prayer revival, God rippled across this nation out of the heart of one man that believed God could do the impossible. But when we talk about revival in contemporary terms, when we speak of this movement of God that comes in and divinely interrupts and, and energizes and reroutes and takes agendas and undoes them and unfolds and pulls back and reveals, what are we talking about? As a young man, uh, being saved out of the drug and alcohol culture of a high school dropout, my first church in the foothills of Tennessee had a whopping 18 people. The youth department started at 68 years of old and went up. That's the truth. Most of my membership, if Gabriel had tooted the horn, he'd had to done it in their living room because they couldn't have heard it. God sat down on that little church and began to move. I didn't know anything other than just door-to-door -door evangelism. I hadn't been educated and told it wouldn't work yet. And so all I knew was to just knock on doors and tell people what Jesus had done in my heart. That little country church said to me, now, Pastor, we'll do anything you want to do. We only have, just, we have one request. In our little church, we, we like to have revival. In the springtime, when the crops get out, we like to have revival. And when we catch the crops in the fall, when the crops are brought in, we, we like to have revival again in the fall. Now, there's a sign, preacher, we had it painted years ago. It's back there in the baptistry with the Christmas tree and the weed eater. And, and if uh, you get that sign out of the baptistry, the man will come by and he'll just change the dates according to the farmer's almanac because he'll know when we get the crops out. Well, I got to studying this thing called revival. And I began to notice that what we were calling revival, we really meant evangelism. But the Bible doesn't talk about evangelism as revival. It talks about evangelism as a byproduct of revival. In fact, let me say it this way. If you've not been vibed, you don't need to be revived. Do you understand what I'm saying? Can I get a witness in the house? Now, our issue, beloved, is not that, that, that we need revival. Some of us just need to be vibed. Evangelism is a byproduct. It is when God sweeps through. So I began to study. And I want to share with you ever so quickly. I want you to listen to just a couple of men who have spoken into my life. Brian Edwards said it this way, we often have a tinted view of revival as a time of glory and joy, swelling numbers that fill our churches and pack our pews. We see revival when the budget increases and the parking lot is packed beyond capacity. But before the glory and the joy, there must first be conviction. And that begins with the people of God. There are tears of godly sorrow. There are wrongs that are put right. Secret things that are to be brought to the light. Bad relationships that have hindered the Holy Ghost of God. Seeds of bitterness and discord, murmuring and backbiting and gossiping must be openly repaired within the church. God will not send life until there is repentance. And if we are not prepared to submit our agendas and lay our watches aside, we best not pray for revival. Beloved, you know as well as I do that the average believer in the average Baptist church could not take a move of God today. It would so interrupt our schedules. It would so absolutely alter our agendas. It would so completely, totally take our bylaws apart. He would not fit in the bulletin. He could not get it done by noon. You and I both know that if God showed up and did what he wanted to do, most of us would have more complaints outside our office than repenting in the altar of God. Bertha Smith said it this way. Dear saint of God, do you not know you have as much revival as you want? Leonard Ravenhill, which is my favorite, said it this way. Revival is when God gets sick and tired, so sick and tired of being misrepresented that he just shows up and does it for himself. <laughs> I want to give you 
you four, four indications, four evolutionary processes to a spiritual revolution. Now, if you got your word of God open, say amen. Now look right here. Look, look what's going on. Look at verse 1. We'll give you the historical context. And the men of Kerjeth Jerim came and fetched. Look at your neighbor and say they fetched. They fetched the ark of the covenant of God. Now I'm going to say something to preface my preaching right now. And I, I, want, I, want you, I want you to understand something. I'm an equal opportunity offender. So if this doesn't make you mad, you just hold on. I'll be around you in a minute. Amen? I want you to understand something. Do you hear this language? That, listen, the, the language of revival does not fetch God. Revival is a sovereign move of a holy God that responds to the brokenness and the contract heart, and you don't fetch God. You don't tell God when He's going to show up. You don't tell God when He's going to leave. And when He gets done, when He gets right and ready to do what He wants to do, He's God, we're not. We might as well get over it. Amen? And this is what has got these people in a mess. In fact, take your copy and go back to chapter 4. I want you to listen to the language. I want you to hear what is going on. Look at verse 3. And when the <clears throat> of uh, first Samuel chapter four, and when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, "Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines?" Listen to this. Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh. That's where it was at this time. Unto us that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hands of our enemies. Do you hear that flippant language? Listen to me, beloved. Pastoring in Tennessee, I watched them in the late 1990s. I watched them rally the churches and call us to Fort Campbell. We're the great screaming eagles of 101st Airborne. We're about to be deployed. In fact, it was, it was still something of a secret at that time. We were brought in as clergy and told we couldn't speak to the media. We couldn't, we couldn't uh, tell anything that we heard in the, the briefings. But as clergy, before they invaded Iraq, we were, we were given sacks and backs, uh, boxes of Bibles. And we were taken into the hangar where the screaming eagles were about to be put on planes and parachute off into Iraq and invade that nation. And we handed them Bibles, we laid hands on them, and we prayed for them. And do you know, beloved, that it was an unprecedented victory in the United States history military campaign. Where our boys came back with almost no fatalities in that first desert storm. And when we called over to Fort Campbell to say, listen... Do you remember us? We're the clergy that prayed. We're the ones that stood in the gap and handed out the Bibles and laid hands on those boys and begged God to bless the United States of America. Do you know what they told us? They said, oh, we won't need the clergy when they come home. We won't need you to meet them in the hangers. We're not going to give them Bibles. We buy down Budweiser. We don't need the preachers here because they've already made it safe. You listen to me, America. It is high time we quit saying God bless America and it's time for America to bless God. And we, you better understand something. There is a crisis coming to this nation economically. There is a setback coming physically and spiritually to this nation. 48% of all of our crops are in drought and distress. Our land is dying. Our, our schools are killing zones. We can't even go to a movie without fear that our children are going to be gunned down in the hour of the entertainment. Listen to me, beloved. If this nation does not repent, fetch the ark. Fetch the ark. Fetch the ark. No, beloved, you'll not tell God on His time. He is not some, some waiter at some table. He is not waiting for us to come to the service desk of a super spiritual Walmart and meet our needs. He is a holy God. And I'm telling you, if this nation does not repent, we are going to pay a price we do not want to pay. Fetch the ark. Now, as Samuel, back in chapter 7, as he begins to unfold what's going on, here's what happens. He shows us... Four components that are part of this evolution of a spiritual revolution. Number one, number one is the he deals with the emotional deception. Now look right there if you would at verse three. And Samuel spoke unto the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and the asterisks from among you. Now we got to deal with the emotional deception. He says, Return with all your heart. There is, an, a, there is an emotional deception that has absolutely saturated in America. We have told our children, some who were called to the mission field, some who were called to the agonies and the pains of the pastorate, some who were called to labor in the fields that are light of the harvest, we have told them that they ought to bypass the will of God because it doesn't remunerate, it doesn't pay. You can't get famous and you can't get financially independent. And you need to go to the university and you need to go where, you, where the money is. I want to say something to you. As preachers, we may never ever live in the finest. We may never drive the finest. We may never be applauded and lauded as the best. But the retirement plan, plan is out of this world. Can I get a witness in the house tonight? I'm telling you, it is high time we tell our children that the American 
as a kid going into the foothills of their, uh, their little 127 acre tobacco farm. And I was on the cusp of a generation. I experienced some things really uh, a little young uh, that most of my generations never seen. As Tennessee tobacco farmers, they had, they had a little old house that they'd built, raised nine kids, two rooms, two front doors. In the front room, there was a couch and a bed and a television. Now, the television had a quilt put over it except for days of our lives and the evening news. Amen? Can I get a witness? Thank you, Brother LeBron. You're very kind. Thank you. Well, at, at, at my grandparents, they, I remember, now they had electricity, but you didn't walk in and flip a switch like you would in our home. You walked to the middle room, you jerked a chain, it looked like a Hitchcock movie for 45 minutes. Now most of y'all don't know what that is. Now I remember the day, I remember distinctly the day that they put plumbing, running water, in the house because my grandfather, my great-grandfather called all the boys into the, into the little tagged on bathroom in the back. Up till then, we had an outhouse out back. And when you went to your, my great-grandparents, you used the outhouse. Now, I've been this size since I was in third grade. So they wouldn't let me go to the outhouse. They said, you fall in, we'll never get you out. That's what they said. So they had a slop jar slid up under the bed. Now, the problem with that was they had wood floors and memo would, would oil that floor up like oil snot. Do you understand what I'm saying? I hear these people say, Boy, I miss them good old days, son. I like mine bolted to the floor. Can I get a witness in the house? <laughs> you have them good old days. Granddaddy called us all in the bathroom. He, like we didn't ever see one. He said, he said, Now, boys, that right there is a commode. He said, now that water right there is not free like it used to come out of that red-handed, red, red handle pump handle in the kitchen. You know, he'd get a hold of that handle, he'd spit it and make a noise. <laughs> Bam! Water come up out of it. He said, now boys, that right there is city water. That costs money. So y'all all get together when you gotta go. <laughs> That's what he said. I can't believe I just said that, but I did. That's what he said. Now here's my point. Now there is a point to this, I promise. We're talking about the evolution of a spiritual revolution. We, we, there, you've got to deal with the emotional deception with all your heart. With all your heart. Your heart's wicked and deceitful, no man can know it. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end there is his death. You lean on your own understanding, he cannot direct your paths. And I'm telling you that my generation, listen, I'll tell you what we want. We want to get married, and in six months we want the same size house. We want to drive the same cars. We want to go on the same vacations. We want everything that it took mom and dad 45 years to get. And we want it six months after we get married. And then we don't want to stay together when six months later we can't figure out how to pay for everything we got. Now, I know that's tough preaching, but bless my soul, somebody better speak some truth because we are emotionally deceived. Refinancing, trying to keep up with the Joneses. Joneses don't even care who you are. Emotional deception. Unbelievable. I'll tell you two of the happiest people I ever met in my life were those Tennessee tobacco farmers. They'd lay a pallet out on that Tennessee porch and they had them old windows. When you'd get a hold of them, raise them up, they had weights in them. And it, it, you'd raise them. I mean, you could throw, you could throw a six-foot man through them. They were huge windows. They'd put us a pallet out on the porch and the wind would blow through. We'd lay on that porch and my great-grandparents would be in that front room after a hard day of labor on the farm. And I'd hear them in there cutting up and giggling and carrying on. <laughs> Never owned an automobile. Rode a farm all into town with a little old makeshift trailer on the back of it to go get supplies. Happiest people I ever met didn't have anything in this world. Tell you, beloved, brother, brother, Dr. Perkins said something this morning, and I, 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 want, I want to say something to you. He talked to us about what the devil had done with Job. Now, I want, I want to say something as I hasten to the next point when we close this message. I believe Dr. Perkins, now this is purely my theory. I can't support this biblically. But I suspect this might have been what happened. I think that Satan pulled a reverse psychological move on America. I don't think he went to God and said, God, I'll tell you what, if you'll take everything away that they've got, they'll curse you and die. I think Satan one day walked into the heavenlies and, and he said to God, God, I'll tell you what, if you give them everything they want, give them a, listen, I'll tell you what, don't give them one house, give them two to worry about. Don't give them one car, give them two to worry about. You give them everything they want. Give them a house down on the beach, give them one up in the mountains, and then divide their time between the two and come see you on Easter and Christmas. Can I get a witness up in the house? I'll tell you what, God, you 
sentence his desperation, they'll put they'll rest upon the arm of filthy lucre, and they'll think, oh God, I don't need you to heal me. I can go to the finest medical facility in the world, and I, I, I'll take care of this, and God, you just wait in glory, and if I need you, I'll fetch you. You've got to deal with emotional deception. You know that heart, but to tell you, you get, you get caught up in something, and you think you can't live without it. It's like Dr. Perkins told us this morning. How many men in this room, thank God, they didn't marry the first woman they thought they couldn't live without? <laughs> Some of you are going, God, I wish I had <laughs> Amen? Don't look around the room. Look up here. Y'all gonna get in trouble. <laughs> now, you move from the emotional deception. i got to be honest about this, God. I have come to a conclusion. Not only was I so lost I didn't know I was lost until the Holy Ghost showed me that I was lost so that I can't get saved and get lost. Now, not only was I so lost I didn't know I was lost till your grace came in and showed me that I was lost and convicted me so that at that point I stood to make a decision either to receive or to reject. Now, Lord, not only in my eternal situation was I emotionally deceived, but Lord, I, I got to tell you, it, it, let me say it the way the old gospel singer said it. Lord, if, 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 if without you holding my hand, I can't make the next step. Lord, I, I don't have enough sense to know what I ought to want. In fact, if you don't give me the want that I want, I won't know what to want. So when I get what I want, I won't want what I got. Amen? You've got to deal with this, God. Boy, well, y'all see it with churches all the time. Boy, oh, Brother Jeff, recommend us, recommend us, Pastor. We want somebody coming here. I mean, shell the corn, shot the corn. I mean, I mean, absolutely tear it up. Six months later, they're going, we don't like him. <laughs> he makes us feel uncomfortable. I just believe church feeling so bad. That's because you're a wicked and on your way to hell. That's why God sent him there. Move from that emotional deception. Now, now here's, here's component number two. Here's component number two. He says, with all your hearts, now watch this, and put away the strange gods and the asterisks from among you. Now we're going to deal with the spiritual desecration. Now, what in the world are we talking about here? here here's what it is. And I know that we're, we're, we're not going to spend much time here. I just want to say this quickly. There are elements inside that have strongholds. Now, Baptists, we don't do well with this. We, we got scared because of the excesses of some other movements in years past. And we have, we have denied, we have ignored, and we, we no longer deal with the spiritual realm of warfare. We don't, we don't deal with generational curses. And I'm not trying to offend anybody. If you don't believe that, that, that's, that, that I'm telling you, I am my, that good-looking blonde over there, she and I are the first generation in, in five in my family that will not get a divorce. The first in five. Her, her, my children never seen me drunk. They've never seen me raise my hand to their mama. They've never, never, never heard us. Now, we, we said early on, divorce is not an option. Murder, that could be. But divorce is not an option. Amen? Amen. I told her, I said, listen here, woman, you ever leave me, I'm going with you. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm telling you, you listen to me. We have allowed strongholds to ease in. And one of the reasons that we are not experiencing revival is because we no longer, no longer are warring against powers and principalities. We are no longer standing and saying, I'm going to tell you something, Satan. It may be fanatical. It may be, it, it may be relegated to the rogue charismatic operator. But according to the word of God, I've got some news for you, Satan. That good looking 18-year-old daughter of mine, I in the name of Jesus pray that every hairy naked hormone that would have anything to do but to bless her would absolutely have no position in her life. Oh, I prayed some of them boys right out the door. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm telling you, pray to my, my daughter still doesn't know where in the world. I said, baby, you got bad breath. Don't worry about it. Just move on. I, I just pray them out. I just pray them out. I just pray them out. Oh, yeah. I got a good looking, good looking 16 year old boy. He's not built like his daddy. He's tall. Got a chest on him like an F 350 Ford truck, son. He he, he he man up. And them girls, you know, they, they see, I see them. And I, I watch his mama, son. She'll just start praying in her spirit. Lord, if she's a hussy, just right now in the name of Jesus, just back her off. Back her off. Back her off. Back her off. Now don't listen. You get mad at me. Get mad at me. But I'll tell you what, I fully intend to fu fulfill the promise. My children are walking to that altar pure and holy. They are saving themselves for the glory of God. And I'll tell you something, there is a blessing in the Bible. We pray over them. We anoint them with oil. When we moved in our new home in Morocco this week, we prayed, oh God, if there any spirit in this house that was here before we got here, you remove it in the name of Jesus Christ. I don't want a stronghold. I don't want a place where the Lucifer can do anything. He must go to Phil Hoskins Church. I'll tell you.
going on at night. Now watch this, now watch this. <clears throat> let me tell you, let me, you know, you know the Bible says that those of us that are redeemed, we're to speak a blessing. Psalms, hymns, spiritual saints. And you ever heard a Baptist talk to another Baptist? Especially if they're mad. They know psalms, hymns, and spiritual saints. You know what that is? That's a stronghold. Bless God, preacher, you don't know what he did to me. He hurt me, and I'm fixing to give him a piece of my mind. Well, I know you. That won't take long. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I've been studying revival for a number of years, and do you know that, that in the Welch revival, in the Welch revival, it so moved, Dr. Jones, it so moved and so absolutely got outside the walls of the church that the miners in the Welch revival, they started getting saved, and when they went back to the mines to, to do their mining, they had to retrain the mules. <laughs> Don't you remember when your burden got rolled away and you found out your, your name had been put down? 
Can you imagine Monday through Saturday spending time in the Word? It begins to leap off of that page. And as it begins to leap off of that page, God begins to fill your soul. And on Tuesday, you've got a fresh word. And you're walking with your Father who reveals to you that He has sovereignly, determinedly, and orchestratingly put you in the path of a person that's on their way to hell. And on Wednesday, somebody's already come along and they've sown the seed and He invites you to water. And by Thursday, the watering has taken root and you get to watch your workroom becomes a birth chamber to eternity. And on Friday, a co-worker who wouldn't do anything but cuss you has now sought you out, bowed their head and called upon the name that is above every other name. And on Friday, the warehouse became a glory house. And on Saturday, at your private praise and prayer time, you just got to thinking about the fact that the Holy God used you to invite somebody to know Him. I'm telling you, they won't have to work it up on Sunday. You'll be down here with this brother making a laugh. Can I get a witness in the house? Corporate. Corporate. Consecration. Now watch the evidence. I have dealt privately with the emotional deception and I have laid bare my heart and said, Oh God, I desire that which money cannot buy, the devil cannot steal. I want in these last days, like Joel promised, latter day rain. I want to see what Bertha Smith saw in the Ten Ton Revival. I want to see what Percy Ray saw when they shut down the school system because so many teachers got saved. They couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't even have school because of the contrition and the repentance in the community. I want to see what Mandy Beasley saw when a two day meeting turned into a two month move of God. I want to see revival that cannot be explained by man, cannot be stopped by the devil cannot be sold by some marketing firm. Oh God, oh God, oh God, will you do it again? Now watch this. Here's the outcome. Emotional deception is dealt with. Spiritual, spiritual consecration is done privately. Then you have this corporate, this move of corporate consecration. People start getting right. Preachers can't preach because what happens is they, the, the Word's been at work Monday through Saturday. By the time they get ready for the sermon on Sunday, the invitation's got to come before the sermon. Now, I know that's not standard Baptist protocol, and we didn't vote on it, but God does have veto power. Now, now, for the sake of time, let's close this. I, I, I need to give you just a quick warning. I need to give you a quick warning because I'd be less than, well, I, I, I'd be negligent in my service to you if I didn't point out one thing because if we go up out of here taking the double dog there or the triple dog there from Dr. Rebus, then we, we do need to know something about this kind of move. I need you to look at verse 7. The people have repented. They responded to the preaching of the prophet. In verse 7, an odd thing, it, it really is almost a parenthetical statement if you're not careful and don't look at it through the spiritual lens of its truth. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel, <laughs> when they heard that the children of Israel were gathered together. Now, I don't have time to unpack this. Suffice it to say that for some now 25 years, no power on the preaching. No supernatural capacity on the worship service. There has been no voice, no fresh manner, no word. Can you imagine living? Can you imagine going to a church where you couldn't hear your pastor speak a rainbow under the unction and the function of the Holy Ghost of God? 25 years. Subjugated by the Philistines, beat down, depressed, demoralized, revival hits the land. I, I, need, I need to preface this by saying this to you. When, when, when I grew up, my father, my father was, uh, he was 16 when I was born. And um, they, my mom and dad married on his 16th birthday. And my father and I kind of grew up together. My dad was kind of a heavy metal rocker guy. So I grew up in a house with, you know, cheap trick, and kiss, and all that stuff. So when I got saved, there was a whole culture of Christianity I didn't know anything about. Music I had never heard before that overwhelmed me. And I'd just start crying. I'd just break out crying. I thought I was having a hormonal breakdown or something. I'd just start crying. I wouldn't even know why I was crying. And I asked my pastor one day, I said, this music that we sing, it's overwhelming. He said, that's a soul of Zion, Jeff. That's, that's some new stuff in your heart. <laughs> so I took my first church and 
the lovely lady that's now my wife, her dad became our minister of music. And, and uh, she, all the reason she even came to church where, where he was serving and I was pastoring, she was, we'd been in high school together where I had dropped out as a freshman. And her dad went home one day and said, hey, there's a little boy kid down there preaching the gospel where I'm serving. And she said, well, it must be, she called my brother's name because the other one's dead. <coughs> and it had gotten out that I, I had been killed uh, and I'd almost been killed in a drunken accident down in Louisiana. And he said, no, 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 it's Jeff. And she said, no, daddy, if he is alive, he's in jail. So she really came just to prove her father wrong. I'll tell you what, when she walked through the back door, oh, 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 oh. hallelujah. She knew immediately she could not live without me. So, <laughs> so we, we were on our first official date, and, 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 and I'm, I'm her pastor, and, we're, and I took her to a very expensive French restaurant called Chonet's, and we were, we were on our way. And I was so nervous, Dr. Jones, I'm telling you, I was a nervous wreck. My, man, my heart was pounding, my mouth was dry, my hands were sweaty, and I was in the car just thinking about, you know, what to say to her. She's just a stunningly beautiful, unbelievable young lady, and, and I, I just want to impress her. So I, I, I said to her, just making conversation, I said, you know, you know, uh, Chris, um, there's a song that we sing uh, in the church. I said, I, I think we got it all wrong. Now, her family grew up traveling all over the country singing and traveling with the Oak Ridge Boys before they crossed over, and she knew music intricately, and she said, really? I said, yeah, we, we got, where's the song we sing in the church? It's all wrong. She said, that's interesting. She said, what is it? I said, well, it's that song we sing. I love it. It's, it's that song we sing, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. I said, I'm telling you, in my spirit, I think we're singing that song wrong. I said, you know how we do it. There's a sweet, sweet spirit. I said, that, that song was written with more something in it. And we're not, and she, I remember what she said just as kindly, but emphatically, Jeff, you don't know nothing about no music. <laughs> she said, you don't know. She said, that, that, we've been singing that song for decades. That's how we're supposed to sing it. I left it alone. We got married. A few months after we got married, a good friend of mine out of Nashville, a close friend of Bill Gaither, he called me one day. He said, hey, LaVoy. He said, you know what gospel music I introduced you to? He had introduced me to some folk like Vestal Good. <laughs> he said, I got a tape from Bill Gaither. He said, it's about half bootleg. Ain't nobody supposed to have it. But if you come over to the house, we'll watch it. He said that it's really an accidental tape. He said they were in the studio. They were filming, and God just showed up in the middle of that thing. They threw the cameras on, and he said, we got a copy of it. Come over to the house. I want you to see something. I got over to his house, and he threw that tape up in that VCR player. And they got to singing, and about the time they got to going good, this, this red-headed lady by the name of Doris Aker, came across, pushed old Bill right off the piano, just moved him off the piano just like that. And at the bottom of the screen, it said Doris Aker's author, songwriter of Sweet, Sweet Spirit. I got up on the edge of my seat. <coughs> I said, I, I know that's all. So she hit that keyboard, she hit that piano and beat them strings out of there. And I'm telling you, when she hit that thing, she said it like it's supposed to be said. She said, Songs of victory. They sent word back to headquarters. Some 
when the people of God get right. God will show up. Amen. Amen. God will show up. I hope that blessed your heart. Uh, I wish I could preach like him. But I'm not him. May God bless you. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you, Lord, for men that still, Lord, stand in the gap and preach the word unapologetically. I pray the word for Jeff, Lord, for Johnny Hunt, for all of those great men of God, David Jeremiah, Charles Stanley, Lord, uh, just like every one of them, Mike Stone, Phil Hoskins, just to name a few, and that crazy man down there in Jacksonville. Uh, Lord, just bless them, continue to use them, and Lord, send new people in to take their place, to continue to preach the word of God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you bless Foreman and Lord's programs. Just wonderful. Lord, we can, we can be trained. We can be told what to do and how to do. But Lord, we're only going to do when you show up. That's when people get saved. That's when the church will grow. And that's when the church will glow in this community. For your honor, for your glory. Bless your people. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.